Thank you so much. Wow, absolutely beautiful, you guys. I, I have a suggestion. Uh, maybe you've already done this, but man, you guys should mic this place up for live music. Just hire some company that does that kind of thing. And, and you should select 12 or 15 songs, choreograph the whole thing, and invite everybody for a night of worship. Play those 12, 15 songs, record it live, and upload that album to Spotify and iTunes. That would be on loop for me, like a background track for my life. So amazing, so beautiful. Just everything about that was a blessing to me. Thank you, thank you. I'm serious about this. I, I, don't, I don't think you guys think I'm serious. You should, somebody here has enough money to pull that off. You should find some rich person and say, would you pay to get this place mic'd up for live music so we can make an album that can just be uploaded for people to listen to from this church? Years ago, I read, I read this philosopher and uh, I can't remember who he was. I wish I could find this again. And he was an agnostic tilting toward atheism. And uh, he decided, you know, I need to be intellectually honest, so I need to follow the evidence wherever it leads type of thing. You know, the, the Socrates maxim, follow the evidence wherever it leads. So he said, I just need to look at the arguments for the existence of God, J just to be an honest person, right? So he went through the teleological argument for the existence of God. He went through the ontological argument for the existence of God. He went through the cosmological evidence for the existence of God. The ontological argument, all of it. He just looked at all of it and he wasn't persuaded. And you know what? After all those intellectual arguments, he came to a conclusion. He said, hmm, if music alone were the only evidence on the table, I would have to believe in the existence of a good God. Music is evidence of the existence of God. Because music, if you haven't noticed, those who are classically trained, I don't know if all of you are doing this like, you know, out of the womb, but those who actually took music lessons know that music is math. It's math. Music is math, you guys. This is my definition of music. It is emotionally rendered math. That's why music brings a sense of emotional order. I don't know about you, but when, when anything's going bad in my life, if anything's crazy or out of control or chaotic, the first place I instinctually run is to music. And if I just am alone with beautiful music for an hour, it nearly cures anything for me because it brings a sense of order, beauty. It elevates the senses. So that has nothing to do with the message. And I think it's only fair that they give me back some of that time um, on the clock because that really wasn't my time. That was just me saying thank you uh, to the musicians. So they're not doing it. Okay, so let's hurry. I want to talk to you this morning about both the enormity and the intimacy of God's love. The enormity and the intimacy of God's love. I learned all of this kind of in a nutshell from a four-year-old girl. A little girl, I was doing a series of meetings, something like this, years ago, and uh, it was a two-week series, so that's a lot of talking. That's a lot of preaching. And they, so they had children's meetings, of course, so that the children didn't have to sit and be bored listening to me with their parents, right? But there was this one little girl sitting to my left down on the front row. And her mom came to me the first night and said, I told Megan there are children's meetings and she should go to the children's meetings. But Megan insists that she's going to attend all of your meetings and I said, well, she's going to be bored silly. Give her some Cheerios, some felts. And sure enough, she had paper and crayons, and she could keep herself busy while I was four years old. I thought she can't possibly comprehend anything I'm going to talk about. Poor little child. Well, she was comprehending at a level that I wasn't comprehending. Because two, three nights into it, I'd look down, and I got the distinct impression, 
she's actually tracking. She's actually, she's actually listening to this somehow. And then she'd look back down and start coloring, right? I thought, nah, she can't possibly. She's four years old. She doesn't even have vocabulary yet. There couldn't be any sense in what she's comprehending. But I thought, no, there's something going on with this little girl. Her mom came to me again and said, I've told Megan repeatedly, go to the children's meetings. But she told me, I'm not going to the children's meetings, mommy, because I like that man. <laughs> and I said, oh. So I met little Megan. I called her Megan. That was a mistake. She said, my name is Megan, not Megan. I said, okay, Megan. And we became friends. She attended all of the two-week series. And on the last night when everything was being packed up, my computer, my phone, you know, lights are going off, people are leaving, just a few people lingering around. Last night, going to go home. Here comes little Megan up the center aisle like this, very much like this. She came and her mom was behind her coaching her along. And I could see in the distance as she approached the stage that she had a piece of paper in one hand. And as she came up to me, she looked up into my face and she said, Mr. Ty, Mr. Ty, shall I call you Pastor Ty? Mr. Ty. She was just so full of beautiful personality. Mr. Ty, she said with enthusiasm, she said, I love you. I love you. I mean, I really love you with all my tummy. And she rubbed her tummy. She was having a vocabulary crisis. Her mom coached from behind. It's your heart, sweetie. She said, Mr. Ty, that would be all my heart with which I love you. I said, oh, Megan, I love you too. And she handed me that piece of paper. And I found myself looking at the most beautiful piece of art I've ever seen in my life. And I've been through the Louvre in Paris for four days. My wife drug me through that museum looking at ancient art while all I wanted was crepes. We're in Paris after all. Why are we here? And this was the most beautiful. I've stood inches from the Mona Lisa and I was looking at this piece of art. There was a beautiful blue sky. There were some birds. As I'm looking at it, she's looking at me. Then there was a waterscape. Maybe it's the ocean. Maybe it's a lake. And there are two people walking along. And I look at it and I say, thank you, Megan, it's beautiful. And she said, Mr. Ty, do you see it? I said, yes, Megan, it's beautiful, I see it. She said, Mr. Ty, I don't think you see it. So I looked again. I thought, I'm missing something. I need to find it. What am I missing? Mr. Ty, do you see it? Do you really see it? I'm looking. And I said, yes, Megan, it's beautiful. And she pointed and she said, there's a big person and a little person. You're the big person and I'm the little person. Look, Mr. Ty, do you see it? We're holding hands. <laughs> I said, yes, we are. Thank you, Megan. She said, Mr. Ty, do you know why we're holding hands? And I said, why? And she said, because we like each other. That's the whole thing. That's what's going on in the universe. Somebody really, really likes you and me. So much so that the God of the universe, who exists at the pinnacle of all liking, likes you and me with a level of like that if he can work it out, and he is working it out, you and I will spend all of eternity in that picture. Eternity future is made of relational integrity. Eternity future is composed of a social order in which everybody likes everybody. And there's no insecurity or violation between any of us. That's what it looks like over there in eternity future. And it's all based and grounded in the fact that God is love. In our previous session, we discovered that when the Bible says God is love, it means something like God is a social dynamic. God is social union. 
God is love means God is a social dynamic of interaction with no violation between any of the interacting parties. God is love. Now, God's love is both enormous and it's intimate. And what I mean by this is brought to our attention in a verse of scripture that probably all of us are familiar with. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You've read this probably many times, but could you just give your attention to the world and whosoever for a moment? So there's the big idea of God's love for everybody. So this is an accurate statement. God loves everybody. Let us close with prayer. No, no, no. God loves all because God loves each. Do you hear the nuance? God does not love humanity as a mass of unnamed faces. God loves all because God loves each. His love is enormous. For God so loved the world. That's the big embrace. The universal embrace of God's love. God loves everybody. He loves the world. But God loves everybody. And then there's, then there's the whosoever. That's you. That's me. That's the individual person. That's me. In my bedroom. I was a teenager, listening to music and trying to figure out the nature of reality. That's me in my bedroom as a teenage boy, completely and utterly confused by the suffering of the world. That's you. Whatever your history is, whatever your name is, God is present to whosoever, to each one, because God loves All of us. Ellen White articulates it like this in the book Steps to Christ on page 100. The relations between God and each soul, note the language, each soul. The relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. What? Really? Listen, listen. If that's true, everything's going to be okay. No matter what's not okay right now, if we live in a universe governed by a God like that, everything ultimately is going to be okay. Now, C.S. Lewis puts it like this. He, that is Jesus, died not for men, by which he means humanity, homo sapien. (laughs) He didn't die for a mass of nameless faces. He didn't die for men, but for each man, for each human. If each human had been the only human made, he would have done no less. That is to say, if you were the only rebel in the universe, and everybody else was faithful, Jesus would have done no less than what we see him doing in his incarnation and his sacrifice at Calvary. Jesus would have died for you alone, the only lone rebel in the universe. So intimate is his love for each individual. This is the love of God we're talking about. There is a sense, a very real sense, in which you are alone in the universe with God. Now, we know how this works on the human plane, right? If, if you're a mom or a dad and you have a daughter or a son and you're in a busy place with hundreds or thousands of people like a mall or a baseball game or something, lots of people everywhere, you're with all those thousands of people in physical proximity, but you're with your little girl, your little boy, in a very specific, intimate sense so that you're hyper-conscious of your little one, yes or no? 
And if, if you're in the mall or you're at the basketball game and your little boy, your little girl is missing from your sight for like three seconds, you are freaking out and must lay eyes on him, on her. Yes or no? So you're with thousands of people, but you're really with, in an intimate sense, your little person. So that's on the human level. On the divine level, there's a very real sense in which you are alone in the universe with God. When you wake up in the morning, I'm, this is not hyperbole. I'm not going all poetic on you here. This is, I'm telling you the straight up concrete truth. This is prose, not poetry. There is no exaggeration for effect in what I'm about to say. When you wake up in the morning in your first few seconds of fluttering consciousness, God's eyes are upon your face. He is perfectly conscious of you as if you were the only person in the universe of whom to be conscious. When you sit up and begin to stretch, and if you're over 40, you get on the edge of the bed and you begin to rock to get momentum so you can get up. And you begin hobbling through the room and you have that familiar pain in your left knee. God is present to that discomfort and perfectly aware of it. You walk over to the window and you see two hummingbirds dancing in flight and you feel joy. He's present to that joy. You walk out into the living room only to remember that meeting you have today, that uncomfortable meeting that you don't want to have with somebody to explain something to them that's going to be hard to explain. And he's present to all of the entire range and spectrum of your feelings. Because love, by its very nature, is not a divisible sum. It's an exponential reality. Let's illustrate this. Let's imagine, you have an imagination, right? So let's employ our imagination this morning. I want you, in your mind, to imagine something. Imagine, are you ready? Are you ready to imagine something? Say yes, or I'm not going to continue. Okay, so, so imagine you have 10 children. Go ahead, do it. Yeah, I feel you. The first question would be, why did you do that to yourself? But the next logical question would be something like this. You have 10 children. Here's my question. Do you love all 10 children with all your love? Or is it 10% for each of your 100% love? Is it a divisible sum? Or is it an exponential type of thing, right? When Megan said, Ty, I love you with all my heart, did she? Because she has a mom, a dad, a little brother. If she loves me with all her heart, is there any love left for mommy, daddy, brother? Yes, because Megan can love her brother with all her heart, with the totality of her heart. And she can love her mommy with all her heart and her daddy with all her heart. And then she can love some preacher dude with all her heart if she wants to because that's how love works. It is an exponential thing. So you have 10 children. You love each of them with all your heart. Don't you? If you lost one to a tragedy and somebody insensitively said, well, apparently you're very prolific, just have another one. Is that not insensitive? Why is that insensitive? Because you know, intuitively, don't you, that 10 more kids, 100 more kids, could not take the place of the one you lost because your love for each one is as distinct as if that were your only child. Yes or no, is that how love works? That's, how, that's exactly how it works. Now we're human, which means we're finite. Finite in our capacities, right? So the illustration would break down. I don't know at what level it would break down. Like if you had 40 children, for example, the illustration on the finite level of our life, it would break down at that point. You wouldn't even give them, if you had 40 children, you wouldn't even give them names. You would assign numbers, and you would not have a dinner table. You would fill a kettle trough with spaghetti twice a day in the backyard and lock all 40 of them out in two-hour stretches to feed on the spaghetti, and then you'd let them back in the house. Why? Because you're cool and hard and cold? No, because you're finite. You can handle 10. You can't handle 40. 
But God's infinite in God's capacities. God has this whole omne thing going on, which in the Greek means all. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. God is omniscient, all-knowing. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere simultaneously. God has these omne capacities. I want to introduce another omne capacity into your vocabulary. It's not in the dictionary, but if we say it enough, it'll get in the dictionary. Omnipassionate. God is not only omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. God is omnipassionate. That is to say that God is the epicenter of all pure and holy emotion. God feels all the feelings in the universe simultaneously. He is the source of every beautiful impulse that arises in human consciousness, and he is empathetic to every ripple of discomfort that we experience as human beings. God is love, and his love encompasses the totality of all eight billion plus of us. God is omnipassionate. So, an illustration to make this point. This is you, and I don't know why you're not smiling. Cheer up. It's because I don't know how to make it curve <laughs> in my design. Don't be embarrassed by the shape of your head. Everybody has problems. <laughs> you're going to be fine. Your head is fine. Don't be self-conscious about the shape of your head now that I said that. Okay, so this is the individual human. This is you, this is me. This is the single person, right? I'll just use me as an illustration. And this is true of you. Everything I'm about to say is true of all of us individually. This is Ty, and Ty has an inner circle of intimate relationships. An inner circle. For me, this would be my wife, Sue, my son, Jason, my daughter, Leah, my daughter, Amber, then my daughter grew up and she married some guy, what's his name? Jerome. They have two children, Mason and Austin. My wife says Jerome has to be in my inner circle. He's in. <laughs> so this is Ty's inner circle. These are my intimate relationships. Now follow the illustration. Everyone has an inner circle. I don't know who your inner circle is. You have an inner circle of intimate ties, right? Okay, so Ty has a daughter named Amber who has some close relationships besides the one she has with me. She has, for example, a friend named Melissa. I like Melissa. Melissa's my daughter Amber's best friend. So I like Melissa, right? Now, in every relational dynamic, there is a nearness factor that yields a sensitivity quotient. I made this up, but it's true. <laughs> The nearness factor yields a sensitivity quotient or a sensitivity level. On a scale from 1 to 10, I have a nearness factor of 10 with my daughter Amber, which yields a sensitivity level of 10 with my daughter Amber. Are you tracking with the illustration so far? But my daughter Amber has a friend named Melissa. I like Melissa. Let's say that I have a nearness factor through Amber with Melissa. Let's call it 8. It's not 8, but let's call it 8 and it yields a sensitivity level about Melissa of, of eight. But my daughter Amber has a friend named Melissa who has a mother, I think her name might be Julie? Not sure. I've met her on occasion. I don't really know her, but she's Melissa's mom. And Melissa's my daughter's friend. So let's say that I have a nearness factor with Julie, is that her name, Judy? Jacqueline? I don't know her name. Let's say that I have a nearness factor of five yielding a sensitivity level of five. Now, my daughter Amber has a friend named Melissa who has a mom named something or other who has a fourth cousin on her mother's side in the north of Ireland named Billy McGillicuddy. <laughs> Let's just say I don't feel anything about Bobby McGillicuddy. Nothing at all. I'm going to be generous and say 2-2. Two, two. I have a nearness factor of 2 yielding the sensitivity level of 2. If somebody walked in right now and said, sorry, we have to interrupt. Ty, Ty, we have to interrupt. Your daughter Amber, something has happened. She's in trouble. Something's going on. What do you think I would do? 
I would say, see y'all later, drop this stuff out. I'm multitasking on my phone. I'm saying to somebody like Edgar, Edgar, change my flight. But if you walked in and said, Ty, we need to interrupt. Your daughter, Amber's friend, Melissa, is in trouble. I'd say, would you all mind just pausing with me and praying for Melissa? Right? And then I would just continue. If somebody walked in and said, your daughter, Amber's friend, Melissa's mom, Julie is in trouble. I'd say, bummer, and I would keep preaching. (laughs) Not because I'm cold or mean or hard. I don't know the lady. If somebody walked in and said, Ty, (laughs) your daughter Amber's friend, Melissa's mom, Julie's fourth cousin on the mother's side, Bobby McGillicuddy in the north of Ireland, is in trouble, I wouldn't even pause. I would just keep preaching. You're sitting at home, and you're channel surfing, and you come to a little Afghan boy, looks like he's maybe five years old. The newscaster says his mommy and daddy are dead. Tears are streaming down his cheeks. You'll feel something for a few seconds and you'll change the channel and say something like, hey baby, what's for dinner? And you'll never think about it again because you're finite in your capacities. You only have so much emotional bandwidth. You have your own inner circle. You can't feel all the feelings in the world. It would break you. But this is God in our illustration, and God has an inner circle. And in God's inner circle, with a nearness factor of 10, yielding a sensitivity quotient of 10, that's me. And That's you and the little Afghan boy and Bobby McGillicuddy and Melissa and Amber and every single person on planet Earth is in God's inner circle. God's inner circle includes every single person. So speaking of it in geometric terms, you could say something like, God's love is a circle, the center of which is everywhere and the circumference of which is nowhere. That is to say that if you were to ask me right now, Ty, point in this room to the center of God's love. I'd have to just start pointing at every single face. The center of God's love is everywhere and the circumference is nowhere. There are no borders. There's no, you can't, you can't find anybody who's outside of God's hyper-sensitive, passionate love for each individual. Everyone is at the center of God's love. You exist at the center of God's love, as do I. And the lady that you just paid for your groceries recently, and the person that pumped your gas... And that annoying individual who thinks that the passing lane on the highway is to hang out in. You guys, if you're one of those, stop that. I got places to go. Move over. That's the passing lane. You just pass and scoot over. And God loves that person. It's a mystery, but he does. So... Here's how scripture, I'm going to now allow the Bible to wrap language around the thing that we have just realized. So notice this retrospective statement where Isaiah is talking about the sufferings of the children of Israel in in their wilderness wanderings. Remember that in the Bible? So look at this. Isaiah looks back and he says, in all their afflictions, he was afflicted? What's the, what's the modern word that we use for that psychological phenomenon? Empathy. In all their afflictions, he is afflicted? So what is it that's calibrating this sensitivity in God? And the angel of his presence saved them in his love. 
And in his pity, he redeemed them and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. It is God's love that constitutes his capacity for empathizing with all the affliction in the world. God's capacities are infinite. And notice he carries and he bears. This isn't like a physical weight, like a sack of potatoes on a shoulder. This is a poetic way of describing emotional weight. Do you love somebody in this world? Of course you do. When they hurt, don't you hurt? You carry the weight. If my daughter Amber starts to giggle across the room, I don't even know what it's about, and I'm giggling with her in sympathetic vibration. I'm just like, what's funny? Tell me. My family has this thing they do where they laugh about things, and then they refuse to tell me what the funny thing is so I can be tortured all day, and then they might tell me in the evening because I like, I like to know what we're laughing about. So if she laughs, I'm laughing. If I see my daughter tearing up, I don't even know what it's about yet. And I'm feeling, and I must know, sweetie, what is it? What, what are you feeling? What are you going through? Something's wounding you. Something's hurting you. And I'm just a fallen, dysfunctional, messed up, wounded, damaged human being with finite capacities and I can't handle my daughter's suffering without sharing her suffering. God's love is such that in all our afflictions, he is simultaneously afflicted. The scripture says it this way in Hebrews 4, he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. That's an emotional statement. Feelings are emotions. You have emotions. You feel things. When you have emotions, God is present to and sharing in those emotions. God feels all the pain in the world. You can't, I can't, he does. Anybody that you and your finite capacities cannot be there for, you can take comfort in the fact that God is there for them. The fact is that according to Psalm 56 and verse 8, David says to God, you keep track of all my sorrows. What, what are we reading? What is this? Seriously, who writes this kind of thing? What's going on here? You keep track of all my sorrows. Does he, does God literally keep track of all your sorrows and my sorrows? You have collected all my tears in your bottle. It's poetry. There aren't alphabetized bottles on big shelves in heaven full of tears. It's poetry. But the poetry means something. And what it means is that every time you shed tears, God is present to the emotions that gave birth to those tears. You have recorded each one, each tear in your book, in your memory, in the divine consciousness itself, every tear you've ever shed. Is this true, you guys? If this is true, if this is, if, if this is true, don't you see what a wonderful and ultimately beautiful universe we live in? Don't you see that if this is true, everything else falls into place? Don't you see that, that in fact, in one of the most amazing sentences ever written, in my opinion, all of this is said in a single sentence. Ellen White articulates it like this, not a sigh is breathed. What's a sigh, by the way? Do a sigh. What's a sigh? Is a sigh a scream? No, a scream is the antonym for sigh. A sigh is the most, the most minimal, slight expression of some kind of deep internal discomfort that you give expression to. In a, not even a sigh is breathed, not a pain is felt, not a grief pierces the soul, but the throb vibrates to the Father's heart. Wow. Jesus said it this way, and as much as you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me, and as much as you did it not, you did it to me. Jesus is literally saying in this single solitary statement, he is saying, anything I do to anyone, I do to him. I do to God. How so? Well, the same way if somebody 
Somebody does something wrong to your child, to your best friend, to your lover. If somebody does something wrong to somebody you love, you feel the offense, yes or no? Because you love them. Your love necessitates feeling the injustice perpetrated on somebody that you love. So back to John 3.16. In John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whosoever. The word loved here is agape in the Greek, and this is not flattering love. There's nothing romantic about this. Agape is the Greek word for unilateral love or unconditional love. Love that is present in God because of who God is, not because you are necessarily lovable. And you are, but that's not the point here. You're also a fallen sinner. You're a a rebel. There are things about you that are undesirable if you haven't noticed. And God with his agape love transcends your sins to keep on loving you any way. Any way. It's not flattering. Agape love says, I love you because I am love, not because you're fantastic. But check this out. The word agape is the word used in every single instance in the book of John to describe the love of God except one instance. When Jesus comes to the close of his ministry, he says, hey, I've been talking to you in figurative language all along, parables and stories, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. I'm going to tell you the straight, plain truth about the Father. You're going to get it sometime. I'm going to strip away all the metaphors and stories and parables, and I'm going to just tell you straight up the truth about God. And in that day, you will ask in my name, you'll continue praying in Jesus' name, but I won't mediate for you anymore. I won't be the go-between anymore. You will will pray in my name, but I will not pray the Father for you. Why? For the Father himself loves you. That's the straight truth. That's the plain truth. And this one instance, Jesus didn't use the word agape. The Father himself loves you. He used the word phileo. The Greek word for friendship love, something akin to like, I love you, but I also like you, you know? When my wife says, Ty, I'm in love with you. I'm like, yeah, you're a good Christian girl. You have to love me. Even Jesus says, love your enemies. I'm not her enemy, but you know, I've done some stupid stuff. She's a good Christian girl. Of course you love me. But if she says, I'm in like with you, I'm like, whoa, sit down. Tell me more about that. I love you and I like you. Jesus says, God loves you. He loves you. He loves you with agape love, with unilateral, unconditional love. God loves you, but God also likes you. God also likes you. I think Megan is right. I think what's going on in the universe and in this thing called the plan of salvation in the gospel is that the God of the universe is approaching you and me from afar with a piece of paper dangling dangling in his hands. And he comes right up to you and he puts that piece of paper in your hands and he says, do you see it? Do you really see it, Ty? Do you see it? And you look and you see the beautiful blue sky and you see the shoreline and you see a big person and a little person and they're walking along and you see it and God says, look again, do you really see it? There's a big person, and there's a little person. The big person is me, God says, and the little person is you. And if you look real close, you'll see that we're holding hands. Why are we holding hands? Because we like each other. That's why. That's what eternity future looks like. Father in heaven, you're amazing, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for stopping by. I hope and pray that this message was a blessing for you. 
If you'd like to see more content like this, we need your help. You can support the Keene Seventh Adventist Church media ministry by going to AdventistGiving.org, finding the Keene Seventh Adventist Church in Texas, and then putting in your donation to the media line. Your faithful giving and support allows us to spread the gospel online for you and others to participate in. Thank you for your continued support of the Keene Seventh Adventist Church.